The reading this morning is taken from Luke 14, and I'm reading verses 1, and then going to verse 7 to 14. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. Verse 7. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honour at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honour, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this man your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited... Take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honoured in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or relatives, or your rich neighbours. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Um, just one thing. <laughs> I forgot to say, I knew I'd forget one thing, wouldn't I? Carol is not here this morning. She's stuck in Spain. Car broke down. They, they left one um, campsite, and I don't know if it was on the way to the next campsite, but the car broke down, and uh, they're having to wait for a part from here. So really ask you to pray for her, because she's going to miss Wednesday. She doesn't know whether she's going to miss the concert that she's taking part in next week. So it's really sad for her. So please do remember her. And we welcome Jess. <laughs> Father God, we do thank you for Jess this morning. We thank you for her heart. We thank you for what she brings to us from you. Father, just open our hearts to receive that word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, It's great to be back with you this morning. Um, If there's anyone here that I haven't met before, uh, my name's Jess McLaren. I'm the curate at St. Luke's in Leegrave. I came and joined you at your Easter service, and I was back in June. And I thought this morning it would be really good for me, for those of you that weren't here at Easter, to just remind you a bit of my story. Uh, Nine years ago, I encountered Jesus in my life, and it totally transformed who I am. Um, I've been ordained for two years, um, and it's been an absolute privilege to serve in Luton. And I've loved coming to visit you guys. I've been so encouraged uh, at the opportunity. And isn't that the brilliant thing about what an interregnum does for us? It allows different clergy to come and visit, but it also allows us as clergy to come and meet you. So yeah, I've been a Christian for nine years, and I can say that I am totally unashamed to say that I love Jesus. He is everything, and uh, I can see you all nodding because I know I'm among you here, and it's just so lovely to feel so welcome. In May, some of you know that a dream of mine was fulfilled. I went to the Holy Land for 10 days on a pilgrimage. Uh, I've wanted to go for many years, and the opportunity came up with the diocese here, so I said I'm going. I got booked on that trip as soon as I could. I think, actually, I think I was the first. As soon as I could get on there, I was on it. And um, I don't know if there's anyone here that's been. I know you have, Leslie. We were there at the same time, weren't we? Um, It's an amazing, amazing pilgrimage. I would recommend anyone do it. Um, And when you go, um, we started in Jerusalem. We were there for five nights. And um, I've got to say, I had absolutely no idea what to expect. I'm not really one for reading books. Um, (laughs) I've done a theology degree, don't worry. Um, But (laughs) books aren't the natural thing that I go to. Sometimes I watch documentaries. But I've got to say that I'd never watched anything about the Holy Land. So I went completely blind to what I was going to experience. And um, 
if you don't know this, um, they build churches on holy sites. So one of the sites that we went to in the old city walls of Jerusalem was the Holy Sepulchre. Now I was really excited about it. It's the place where uh, it's believed that Jesus was crucified and it's the place where it's believed that Jesus was put in the tomb. As you can imagine, it's a place where I deeply wanted to go. And uh, off we went to the sepulchre and uh, I've got to say I was a little bit surprised at the experience that I had there. There's five denominations of Christians that meet in that place and they've been fighting over a ladder on the outside of the church for 30 years as to whose job it is to remove it. 30 years. Five denominations of Christians. It deeply grieves me. We laugh, don't we? I laugh too. But it deeply grieves me that we've got that that situation going on in Jerusalem. Only 1% of the population there are Christians. And yet 60 to 70% of their tourism is us, Christians from around the world, going on pilgrimage to visit those sites. And um, it was recommended to me, now I'm not a morning person at all, but it was recommended to me to get up early on the Sunday morning and to go to the sepulchre because there's services that take place. And, uh, and I was told that it would probably be something that I'd want to see. So I got up at 6 a.m. And I went, it, actually, I'm, one of the main reasons I'm glad I went is because I got to experience the city when it was quite quiet. If you've been to Israel, most of the time it's bustling. If you close your eyes and you listen to the sounds, it feels as though you could have been there 2,000 years ago. And it's, but that morning I went through, this, through the streets. It was, there was no one around. It was like a ghost town. And um, I walked into the sepulchre and I, and I walked towards the tomb. First of all, I was confronted by the fact that there were two services going on at each end of the tomb. So there was, there was one group of Christians at one end and there was another group of Christians at the other end. And the reason being is that they can't get on so they can't worship together. And do you know what captivated me and do you know what got my attention? Not listening to what was going on on either side of that tomb, but being drawn to a man that was at the side of the tomb and he was clinging to it. He was absolutely, desperately praying to God, praying to Jesus, clinging to the tomb. And for me, that's what I needed to see that morning. That's what I needed to be reminded of. Not not the Christians worshipping at one end and the Christians worshipping at the other end that couldn't get on, because don't we know that so well? But the man who was clinging to the side of the tomb a place that's normally surrounded by tourists, but on this early morning on a Sunday, he could get close. So he got close and he clung to it. And I don't know about you, but I I stood there in Jerusalem and I thought to myself, is it any different now to how it was 2,000 years ago? And if Jesus was to walk into that place now, would he be made welcome? Then we look to our own context, a place where we know that Christianity has seen major decline, a place where no religion's massively coming up on the census as one of the biggest groups. It's labelled as irrelevant, isn't it? People say, oh no, you're religious, I'm not. I haven't got any time for religion, I don't need it, it's irrelevant. But honestly, as we've, just, as we've just heard prayed this morning, if we look to our news, if we look to our political situation, could it be any more relevant for our time that people need to know the love of Jesus? People need to know the, the life-changing and transformational love of Jesus. And it's said that the six biggest pains of our time are dissatisfaction, emptiness, loneliness, guilt, failure, and fear. They are the biggest pains of our time. So is it any wonder, I wondered, thinking about this the other night, when our TV screens are bombarded by reality TV? Reality? What what reality is there in these programs that we're watching? Love Island. Love Island? Is that love? I have never watched it. I put my hands up. I've never watched it. And actually, for me, it's a crime that it's still on TV when young men have taken their lives because of what that program's done to them. It's not reality, but people are buying into it. People are feeding off it. Why? Because, like I said, the six biggest pains of our time are dissatisfaction, emptiness, loneliness, guilt, failure, and fear. 
So what's real anymore? People have got selfie addictions. Does anyone, everyone know what that is? It's when you take a picture of yourself on your smartphone. They're addicted to it. They don't like a picture. They just put a filter on it. Lives being projected as perfect on social media. And yet I think we're experiencing loneliness like never before in our world and in our population. Would we welcome Jesus today if he walked into our midst We are people that don't lose hope, for he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what does Jesus have to say to us this morning from that gospel reading that we heard? Well, the truth is the Pharisees wanted to follow religion, didn't they? They were interested in religion. They weren't interested in following Jesus. And Jesus challenges them. He challenges them because they go in and straight away they choose the place of honor at the table. And he says in verse 11, For those of you who exalt yourselves will be humbled, and those of you who humble yourselves will be exalted. And then he challenges them, don't just invite the people that are like you. Don't just invite the people that are like you. And he says in verse 13, but when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Luke's gospel is the gospel that has more meals scenes in it than any of the other gospels. And it comes together in the Last Supper and then the road to Emmaus. And Jesus is telling them a parable. Now, you might listen to this scripture and think, oh, he's just giving them some social advice. Don't take the place of honor. Don't invite people that are just like you. But parables aren't like that. They have a double meaning. They have lots of layers and lots for us to take from them. And and he uses parables because he wants us as the hearer to work out what his true meaning is. So what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about the way in which the people of his day were jostling for position in the eyes of God. They were jostling for position. They were religious and they wanted to get higher than anyone else in their position in the eyes of God. And it didn't matter how it got them there. In Jeremiah 2a, it's one of the lectionary readings for today from the Old Testament. It says, the priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The priests did not know God. They rebelled against him. Now, something that I read yesterday, it says, five ways that you can spot a follower of Jesus, and these are them. They talk about him, leaving you wanting to know more and not less. They seek to love their enemies. They are full of compassion for outsiders and the weak. They are quick to show others mercy. And when they describe what God is like, they describe Jesus. Do our lives point to Jesus or do they point to religion? Are we striving, I wonder, for position in the eyes of God? Some time ago, I remember I was at an Azalea prayer meeting. Azalea is a Christian organization in Luton, working with women that are caught up in sexual exploitation. And the leader there, Ruth, said this, and it hit me hard. After seven years of being a Christian, you are more likely to resemble a Pharisee than a follower of Jesus. After seven years of being a Christian, you are more likely to resemble a Pharisee than a follower of Jesus. Now, I'm not here to condemn you this morning. But when I heard that, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Because I don't know about you, but I can quickly get swallowed in. I can quickly get swallowed in into religious ways. Because religion forms the God that it wants to believe in. And the easiest place to hide from God is behind religion. The easiest place to hide from God is behind religion. I say it again, the Pharisees wanted to follow wanted to follow religion but they did not want to follow Jesus. And God is more interested in our spiritual fruits than in us being religious nuts. But the truth is if we look at the church across our land, we've made it acceptable for people to sit in church week after week and do nothing and still call themselves Christians. In today's gospel reading, Jesus comes 
And what does he do? He turns things upside down. To the Pharisees, Jesus is associating with the wrong kinds of people, isn't he? He's touching the untouchable. He's calling the nobodies. They don't like it. They only want people of honor at their table. In Jesus' day, it was all too easy for the well-off and the legally trained to imagine that they were superior in God's sight. To the poor, to those without the opportunity to study, let alone practice the law. But within this gospel reading today, there's a wider meaning as well. Thousands of non-Jews were becoming Christians, you see, and they were entering the dinner party as well. But the Christian Jews were finding it incredibly difficult. They weren't just finding it difficult, they were actually finding it impossible to approve or understand. They didn't want to widen the table. They didn't want other people becoming Christians. And they were so eager to maintain their places at the top table that they couldn't grasp God's great design to stand the world on its head. Their pride crippled them. For me, it's all about pride here. You see, if we reckon that we deserve to be favoured by God, not only do we declare that we don't need him and that we don't need his grace and his mercy and his love, but we imply that those who don't deserve it shouldn't have it. Pride, it cripples us. The Pharisees were focused on pushing themselves forward, as I said earlier, and they wanted, they didn't care. They wanted to push themselves forward, they didn't care who they left behind. And here, Jesus is confronting them with the large-hearted love of God. The Pharisees, as I've said twice, wanted to fo follow religion, but they didn't want to follow Jesus. Religion forms the God that it wants to believe in. And as I said, don't we all get sucked into it? We start living out our faith like we can earn God's love. Perhaps by seeking to be perfect, the best at service, the best at stacking chairs. We're the last one in the room. Don't worry, everyone, I've got it. But we can't find safety in religion. For worse still, we'll carry it out and we'll just fake our faith. So this morning... Maybe we are here and we are hungry because our faith has maybe become a bit stale. Maybe it's feeling like a chore. And if that's the case, then maybe we're getting sucked into religion. If our walk with Jesus has become stale, perhaps we're getting sucked into religion. If we're spending more of our lives, more time feeling condemned, then our faith has been replaced by religion. You see, religion says do, Jesus says done. Religious says slave, Jesus says son. Religious, religion puts you in bondage, Jesus sets you free. Religion says, if you change first, then you can join us. Jesus says, come, join and follow me, and you'll be changed. Religion is fueled by fear and punishment. Jesus is fueled by love and mercy. I love this one. Religion grades righteousness on a curve. Jesus grades righteousness on a cross. Religion is safe and practical. Jesus is radical and unpredictable. Religion says if you follow God, he will bless your life. Jesus says if you follow God, he will give you life. Religion says come to church and serve. Jesus says go into the world and serve. Religious took Jesus to the cross, but it could not hold him there. He demonstrated love for his enemies. He showed compassion for those who persecuted him. His love never fails. A love so wide, a love so deep, that we can struggle to fathom it, can't we? But our goal, our calling, is to become more and more like him. So our invitation, what I believe he's calling us as a church today to be invited to receive is, will you welcome me today? Will you welcome me today? And so I'm going to invite the band up and we're going to, we're going to sing a song in response this morning. His love is wild for us. That's what I want us to be encouraged. I don't want us to go out feeling condemned. I want us to be encouraged because his love is wild for us. He wants us to experience joy. He wants us to experience truth. He wants us to know just how much he loves us. So we're going to stand and we're going to sing in response.
the king of my heart.